You may have heard that there's no formula for the prime numbers, but that's not exactly true. In 1964, C.P. Willens found this beast of a formula for the nth prime number. We'll break it down into pieces, but feel free to pause the video to digest it a little, or for it to digest you. Its components are all basic arithmetic and trigonometric functions, along with some ones, twos, and this pi sitting down here for some reason. And somehow, this particular assemblage of functions that have nothing to do with primes on their own actually computes primes. Plug in one, and it gives you the first prime. Plug in four, it gives you the fourth prime. Plug in 1,000, it gives you the 1,000th prime. Amazing. So what kind of sorcery is this? Surely there's some trick, because the primes are supposed to be kind of randomly distributed among the integers, so there shouldn't be a formula for them. But on the other hand, if you type Willen's formula into your favorite programming language, it really does compute primes for you, at least for small values of n, before precision starts to become an issue. Symbolic software, like Mathematica, will give you primes for larger values of n. The thing is, it's not particularly fast. And this is a hint about what the formula is doing, and that maybe there are some caveats. So let's see how it works, working our way from the inside out. The innermost piece is j minus 1 factorial. For example, when j is 5, this is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 which is 24. Then, Willens tells us to add 1 and divide by j. When we do this for j equals 5, we get 5. What if we change j to be 6? 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 is 120. Add 1 and divide by 6, and we get 121 over 6. Here's a table with more values. Do you see a pattern? When j is a prime, it seems that we always get an integer. And when j is not a prime and not 1, then we don't get an integer. And this is the secret behind Willen's formula. There's a theorem called Wilson's theorem, not to be confused with Willen's, that says that j minus 1 factorial plus 1 is divisible by j precisely when j is a prime number or j is 1. This implies that when we divide by j, we get an integer when j is prime or 1, and a non-integer when j is composite. We've just built a detector for prime numbers. So how do we turn a prime detector into a prime computer? We can certainly use a prime detector to compute the nth prime in a not very clever way. For example, to compute the fourth prime, we could start checking each positive integer for primality using our prime detector keep track of how many primes we've seen, and stop once we've seen four primes. Ready? One is not prime, even though our detector throws it in with the primes, so we have to be careful about that. But after one, we're good to go. Two is prime according to our detector, so it's the first prime. Three is also prime according to our detector, so it's the second prime. Four isn't prime according to our detector, but five is, so it's the third prime, and so on. What Willens does is implement this not very clever method in a very clever way. Because the thing is, if we were using a standard programming language, we could easily implement this with a while loop and a counter to keep track of how many primes we've seen. But what if we don't have a standard programming language at our disposal? Well, Willens was still able to do it, using traditional mathematical functions instead. First, it helps to modify our prime detector so that it outputs ones and zeros rather than integers and non-integers. This will make it much easier to work with. To convert integers to ones and non-integers to zeros, we need an integer detector. So what kind of traditional function can distinguish between integers and non-integers? If we look back at the formula, we see what Willens came up with. The next operation is to multiply by pi and plug the result into cosine. Let's see why this works. Here's a plot of cosine of pi x. It hits its maximum value of positive 1 at 0, 2, 4, all the even integers. And it hits its minimum value of negative 1 at the odd integers. So when x is an integer, cosine pi x is either negative 1 or positive 1. And when x is not an integer, cosine pi x is strictly between negative 1 and positive 1. 
This means that the cosine in Willen's formula spits out plus or minus 1 if j is 1 or prime. And it spits out a number strictly between negative 1 and positive 1 if j is composite. What's next? Then we square the cosine. The negative ones become positive ones when we do this. So the squared cosine in Willen's formula is 1 when j is prime or 1. And it's a non-negative number that is strictly less than 1 when j is composite. Then we take the floor. This leaves the 1s alone and collapses everything else to 0. So we get our improved prime detector that outputs 1s and zeros. It's 1 if j is prime or 1, and 0 if j is composite. Isn't it beautiful that this is possible? With this prime detector, we can start counting primes by summing over a range of values for j. For concreteness, here's the sum when i is 10. j takes each value from 1 to 10, and the detector contributes a 1 to the sum every time j is prime or 1. There are four primes in this range, so the sum is 5. In other words, this is the number of primes up through 10 plus 1. In general, if we sum up to i, we'll get the number of primes up through i plus 1. So this whole complicated denominator has a very straightforward interpretation. It just counts primes. But wait, why are we counting primes? Willen's formula is supposed to compute the nth prime. We just determined that there are four primes up through 10, but we want to determine the fourth prime. Well, that's basically the inverse function of what we currently have. The idea is that if we want to know the fourth prime, then we ask, is the number of primes up through 1 less than 4? Is the number of primes up through 2 less than 4? Eventually, the answer will be no. And the first time it's no will be when we're at the fourth prime. So the rest of Willen's formula loops through the question, is the number of primes up through i less than n for various i? And this will tell us when we've reached the nth prime. It requires another bit of clever engineering, though. Let's look at the next component, where we finally see an n. It divides n by the number of primes up through i, plus 1, and then raises the whole quotient to the power 1 over n. When we evaluate Willen's formula, we're going to be fixing n and varying i, but this part is actually easier to understand if we fix i and think of varying n. Take i to be 10 again. We know there are 4 primes up through 10. Here's what the curve x over 4 plus 1 to the 1 over x looks like. We're going to take the floor of this function too, so let's see where it reaches height 1. Looks like it's at x equals 5. This makes sense, because when x is 5, then the quotient is 1. What happens to this curve for larger values of x? It looks like it might keep going up. But if we increase the range, we see that it hits a maximum and then starts coming back down. That means that when we take the floor, we'll get 0 for integer values of x up through 4, and 1 for integer values of x greater than 4. The result is that we've just implemented an inequality using nothing but arithmetic. We have a detector for numbers that are greater than 4. It takes some thought. But you can check for yourself that when you change this 4 to other values, this equation still holds. In our current example, 4 is the number of primes up through 10. In general, this will be replaced by the number of primes up through i. This lets us answer the question, is the number of primes up through i less than n? Of course, when we go to use Willen's formula to compute the nth prime, it's not n that will change. It's i that will change, because of the summation we're about to get to. So let's rewrite the conditions in this equation so they look more like conditions on i rather than n. The condition that n is greater than the number of primes less than or equal to i is equivalent to the condition that the nth prime is greater than i. For example, n is greater than 4 precisely when the nth prime is greater than 10. Now reorder each inequality to put the focus on i. This is now a detector for numbers i that are less than the nth prime. And from here, it's smooth sailing. The final step, well, almost final, is to sum over all i from 1 to 2 to the n. Again, let's look at an example. If n is 4, we're letting i go from 1 to 16. 
for each value of i less than the fourth prime, we get a 1. So overall, we end up with 6, which is 1 less than the fourth prime. But why is it enough to stop the sum at 16? Well, we need to go high enough to guarantee that we go above the nth prime. Of course, we're trying to compute the nth prime, so we don't know exactly how high that is. A very rough estimate is provided by Bertrand's postulate, which was conjectured by Bertrand in 1845, and proved a few years later by Chebyshev. It says that for every integer m greater than or equal to 2, there exists a prime number p between m and 2m. That means that there's a prime between 2 and 4, another prime between 4 and 8, another prime between 8 and 16, and so on. Since 2 is prime itself, Bertrand's postulate guarantees n primes between 1 and 2 to the n. So the nth prime is somewhere less than 2 to the n. In reality, the nth prime is far less than 2 to the n. But by now it's pretty clear that Willens wasn't overly concerned with efficiency. So the sum up to 2 to the n is guaranteed to include all values of i that are less than the nth prime. Therefore, in general, this sum is 1 less than the nth prime. This is why the very last step is to add 1. And there it is. We have a formula for the nth prime number. Or do we? In practice, Willen's formula is excruciatingly inefficient. We have a ridiculous sum up to 2 to the n. Evaluating each term in that sum requires another large sum, and in that sum we have to compute j minus 1 factorial a bunch of times, which involves roughly j multiplications each. So even for reasonably small values of n, this formula takes forever. In 1982, 18 years after Willen's formula appeared, Herb Wilf, who has yet another name beginning W-I-L, wrote an article called What is an Answer? in which he argues that we should judge a formula like we judge an algorithm, by how quickly it produces results. We shouldn't accept an answer to a question that takes longer to compute results than the original definition of the thing it's supposed to be computing. He writes, The point, of course, is that sometimes the answer is presented as a formula that is so messy and long, and so full of factorials and sign alternations and whatnot, that we may feel the disease was preferable to the cure. <sighs> Ouch. Wilf doesn't mention Willens' formula specifically, but his description hits pretty close to home for Willens. Willens' formula definitely doesn't pass Wilf's test for being an answer to the question, what is the nth prime number, since there are faster and less complicated ways to compute the primes. So what's the point of Willens' formula? Well, you could think of it as a joke, like, haha, here's a formula for the nth prime that is correct, but totally useless. But there's something more interesting going on. At its core, Willen's formula isn't telling us how to compute primes. It's telling us what's possible to engineer with the basic ingredients of arithmetic, a pinch of trigonometry, and a dollop of number theory in the form of Wilson's theorem. It shows that you can use basic arithmetic functions as a programming language, and that that programming language is expressive enough to describe the nth prime number. And that's pretty surprising. It means that a class of functions that doesn't know anything about divisibility or primality is actually quite rich. It can tell when a number j is prime. It can compute the number of primes up through i, and it can compute the nth prime number. And in 1964, you wouldn't expect any of that. By the way, essentially nothing seems to be known about C.P. Willens, which is a real shame. The formula appears in a three-page article called On Formulae for the Nth Prime Number in the Mathematical Gazette. And yes, there are other formulas in the article that I didn't talk about in this video. So check it out if you're interested. But Willens has no other articles that I'm aware of. I don't even know Willens' first name. Could it be a pseudonym for someone who didn't want to tarnish their reputation by writing about useless prime-generating formulas? The article lists the University Birmingham for Willens' affiliation. If anyone can dig up more information, that would really be great.